Welcome to Daddy vs. Doctor. Here are your hosts, pediatrician Dr. Scott Cohen and comedian Sebastian Maniscalco. All right, we're jumping right in here. Daddy vs. Doctor coming off a holiday uh, vacation. You went back east. I went to Utah, but I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> okay. I want to jump into the business of pediatrics. All right. And as I look at the landscape yeah. of uh, the medical field, could you clue us in on how much schooling you had to go through to start working? What's what's the... So high school, obviously, four years of college, yeah. four years of medical school. Okay. And then depending on your specialty, there's a number of years of extra training for specialty. For pediatrics, it's three years. Okay. So three years of residency. It's 11 years. Right. So 11 years post high school. Post high school. So about 27, 28, you're ready to enter the uh, workforce. Right. So my first job where my buddies, you know, who took jobs right out of college have already been working, making money for about a decade before I'm starting. Okay. So the amount of schooling that you have to do, mm -hmm. would you recommend anybody getting into the medical field now uh, as a profession based on the amount of time and money you have to spend to get to where you're working. I mean, you own your own practice, right. but what about a guy that, that's going, eh, I want to be it's, a pediatrician? It's, it's, a, it's a great question. And I, I, God, I haven't been asked that in a really long time. The, the bottom line is you should do whatever you really love. You should go and do it. That, that's the bottom line. But medicine has changed a lot, and it's much more difficult, I think, than it used to be. And I remember going to medicine, and the older doctors at that time were like, oh, medicine's changed, and it's not like how it used to be. And I used to be thinking, oh, look at those old doctor curmudgeons. You know, everybody wants to say their time was the best time, and now I find I'm saying the same thing. Um, you have to absolutely love what you do in anything, but especially in medicine, to go through what you have to go through. And and look, this is only my only point of reference. I'm sure for a lot of jobs you go through a lot. But for the amount of education, the amount of debt you take in, and at the end of the day, in a lot of professions in medicine, you end up, I hate to say it, you're a little bit of a service person. You know, I, I look back, I remember growing up and if somebody introduced you to a family friend and they said that they were a doctor or a lawyer, it was like a revered profession, right? Would you agree with that? Well, that's my point. I mean, now you're looking at it and it's like, based on the amount of time and energy you have to put into becoming a doctor, there's people on uh, OnlyFans that are showing their feet making <laughs> making fifty five thousand so, dollars a month. I miss my calling. So exactly. I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, granted, they don't have uh, you know, uh, you know their, their reputation is not as prestigious as one with a engineering lawyer or doctor degree. But I'm sitting there going, what 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 right? minded person would come out of high school and going, I want to get into the medical field and they're going to go, Oh yeah, well it's going to be 11 years until you start making any money. I mean, I know, but I think most people, especially if you talk to pediatricians, we didn't go into it for the money. We obviously did it because we love it and we feel like we're helping people. And I hope that we are. I think the majority of people do, you know, appreciate the the service that we're giving and hopefully we're we're helping people and changing lives um but it is it is a grind and it's it's interesting because i was just talking to a younger doctor about this the things that we're asked to do most we actually never learned in school right so i run my own practice um I've never taken a business course in my entire life. I never took one in high school. They never took one in college. They didn't offer one in medical school or in residency training on how to run a practice. That would be a great course. Um, I'm asked daily about things like, I'm, I'm counseling patients on exercise and nutrition, but those classes are actually very limited also in med school and residency. These are the things we need to change because I think that when we talk about medicine, especially pediatrics as a preventive medicine, it's really important that we look at things that help 
prevent disease and improve longevity as adults? And what are those things that we talk about as adults? Exercise and nutrition. And that has to start when you're younger because routine and repetition make a difference. So looking back at your education, is there any part of you that goes, yeah, 11 years, but they could cut three years out of this and I'd be fine? Or did you need all the 11 years? behind you was there courses like yeah i'm looking back at my own education like geometry and stuff like that mm -hmm. was it was yeah it really no. needed so or? i think a lot of it is to weed out who can and who can't it's higher level thinking but i do think it could be streamlined absolutely for example so when you when you go to college there's four prerequisite what they call pre-med courses in order to take your pre-medical boards to apply to medical school. And the four classes are biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, and physics. Those four classes have very little to do, if nothing to do, with what I'm doing now. Why do you take them? I assume to weed out the people who have that higher level thinking or not. The biology, which would be the only one that would be really actually important for future medicine, half that year is plant biology. I, to be honest, don't care about stamens and pistols and plant biology at all. That should be all human biology. I actually think what they should do is, so what they do is you take those four courses in order to take a medical board to get into med school. Your first two year, med school is divided in four years. The first two years are purely in the classroom. You sit, you learn, you memorize material. That's it. The second two years, you're you're practicing medicine. You're going through different fields. You do a rotation in surgery. You do a rotation in pediatrics. You do a rotation in OB-GYN to see what you like, to see what you want to do later on in life. What they need to do is take some of those first two years of medical, which are so important, anatomy, physiology, neuroanatomy, the things about the body, move those, I think, to college, right? That's what I really need to learn. So now I've sped up two years and then get right into some of the more, you know, patient oriented stuff when I get to med school. And hearing all that, yeah. my conclusion is only fans <laughs> show your feet. 55 grand a month. You know what? But here's the thing. Don't you think, right? Everything does seem easier online, right? There's people making a lot of money on fans. But we probably forget about the millions and millions of people who try to do it who never succeed, right? We're only seeing a small percentage. It just seems like everybody is making money nowadays yeah. for pure mediocrity. Like there's no like, <laughs> it just seems like people are being rewarded. It's not organized by, right, the, the right. Like you would think 11 years of schooling and, and studying and this, that, and the other thing, you come out and you're making 1.5 out the door, right? It just seems like a lot of work. Well, at least paying off my debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm still paying off school student loans. This next topic, which we just discussed prior to us getting up here, you got your blood panels and mm. and you're like, oh, you know, I got this, I got that. I'm probably going to have to go on medication. Now, medication seems to be, I, listen, I'm on, t uh, I took a shot of Toradol. Mm -hmm. No. Anti-inflammatory medication. The, the name alone would suggest that I'm on some type of horse tranquilizer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, you're like an NFL football player <laughs> going into the game. If, All right. If, if, or war. Is that strong? Is it's it, strong. It's a very strong anti-inflammatory. I think anything they give it with a shot, assume it's strong. <laughs> okay. So I had one of those in, before I went on the Utah trip mm -hmm. to kind of get me through Utah. And then he also gave me, it's probably the wrong name, is Celebrex sound right? Celebrex is correct. Yeah. Is that an anti-inflammatory as well? Similar, yeah. And and different type. Uh, and what's your take on 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 these types of these types of medication to get you through a vacation? <laughs> right. I mean, we got to get to an if you're if you're taking these medicines, which I consider strong medicines. Now, I don't deal with these medicines as much in pediatrics. Yeah. Um. But these, you know, these are strong anti-inflammatories to get to a point where you're comfortable. Now we've talked about we got to get to your underlying issue yeah. and fix the underlying issue because you're yeah. not going to take these medicines. No, no, term. this is just getting me through the the year, and right. then I'm I'm going to be uh, 
taking the proper steps to get right. But for Utah, I needed some some help. And, and the, the funny, the audience should know that you did this to get to Utah. You don't even ski. No. So it was really to get you to Utah to sit and Uber drive people around. It was to in put, a comfortable position. Yeah. Just to put the clothes and skis on my kids. <laughs> right. To bend over <laughs> to do that. Which I found interesting. Talking about bending over. I went to go bend over yeah. to put the shoe on. And I used to have be able, when I bent over, my chest would land on my knees. Right? Is okay. That me? I stop at like a 45 degree angle and I almost got to stretch to put the ski boots on, which is concerning. Uh, and that's another reason I... I've got to take care of this um, this sciatic pain. Um, can you can you balance on one foot? Uh, let's check it out. Let's see. So I was just reading that when we when we talk about longevity and right, people. Now? Let's see. Just, is it, just just balance on one foot. Is it a simple thing for you? Yeah. And the other one? Yeah. Yeah. See, it seems like a simple thing, and I agree. I can balance on one foot too. But they talk about as you get older. A marker of longevity is is balance because if you think about people who don't have good balance, they're tripping over rugs and stairs and things like that. The other thing is grip strength. Interestingly, do you have good grip strength? Um, you know, my father in law, as as a stocking stuffer, unbeknownst to this conversation, got me one of those. Um, I don't know what the, what they're called. The grip things yeah. goes up to ninety pounds. I don't know what you do with it. You just keep doing that yeah those, maybe he knew the stress that i i face on christmas old time. school i used to have those my grandfather yeah. used to be doing that all the time for some reason um <laughs> so i don't know grip strength i'll uh, bring that over we'll see if it's well, 90 pounds i don't i have a lot of strength i figured this out i uh due to the fact that my biceps now are collapsed i don't have a lot of arm strength because i haven't been working out with weights really uh basically What's happened to me yeah. is me. I am 50, and at this point in my life, if I start, if I have to live like this the rest of my life, yeah. I am not in a good place right now. No, you got to change it. So, Habits. So I, I need to totally revamp my health and wellness coming into 2024. Um, that being said, and getting back to pediatric and kids, and I'm just talking from my own perspective, and he's not here right now. Maybe when he gets in, we could take a look at Caruso. Caruso, in my opinion, and Lana's, looks skinny. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, and it's not like he's not eating. I'm wondering, is he growing faster than he's eating? Possible. Um well, you know what what ends up happening if you look at growth curves, which that's all I do is spend days looking at growth curves. So when you look at a growth curve in the first year of life, you know, as parents, we we perseverate on on weight gain, right? You know, you want to see good weight gain. If you look at that curve, the the average line is about a 45 degree angle. And then what happens after a year? The best eaters, every parent comes in between one and two and says, My child used to eat well and now they're very poor eaters. They're very picky. They skip meals. And this happens for two reasons. One, developmentally, they'd rather do anything but sit still, right? They just want to run around and move. And second is actually physiologic. It doesn't take as much to gain weight. So the curve starts to level off. And then from two to six, if you look at the average weight gain, it's almost a flat line. But the height gain continues about two inches a year at a 45 degree angle. So imagine your height, it's exactly what you're saying. Your height's continuing at a 45 degree angle, but your weight is leveling off. So everybody starts losing their baby fat. And that's why you often see kids thin out between two and six, because physiologically, it doesn't take as much weight, doesn't take as much to gain the appropriate amount of weight um, as previously. What is the medical term? Is it anemic when the kid looks skinny? No, anemic means you have uh, low hemoglobin hematocrit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, because I did notice there's a little, like some black underneath yeah. his eyes. So dark circles, we can see if you're if you're really anemic. And we check that. We checked it when he's 10 months old. We check it again at four, but we can check it in between if we're concerned. You also see it sometimes with allergies. They call them allergic shiners when people have dark circles under their eyes. Um, and some people's faces just have sort of darker areas just because of the, the shape of their face. Um, but yes, anemia is one reason. And if you're not eating well, 
right? You're not getting enough iron in your diet. Iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia. So that would go together with low weight, poor weight gain, and low blood levels. Do you know any of foods that are rich in iron that kids might enjoy? I mean- Typically, the ones we think about aren't the ones that they like, right? Eggs, fish, meat. But you can also get it in beans, green leafy vegetables, tofu, so okay. things like that. I had a question mm-hmm. uh, asked to me earlier this week from uh, a parent. Yeah. Have you heard of what? what is white lung? Have you, have you heard of this? No. Okay. This must be something obscure. Uh, white lung. Is what a pediatric condition? White, I, don't, I don't know. Look this up, Fis, on the on the internet. If if white lung is a thing, I don't know if people are coming up with their own terminology in regards to what's happening now with kids and how long the sickness and illness is lasting. Mm. I, yeah, I, I haven't heard the 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 term white lung, but I will tell you that what the biggest complaint parents have in the winter time is coughs because coughs linger for three to four weeks at a time. I don't think they used to, I'm sorry. I, know, I just, I, know. I, don't, I don't think you saw a doctor for it. I think your parents were just <laughs> like, you have a cough, go to school and that's it. But but no, it's typical. A, a month cough. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, this is what, when, when people come in and, and this is what I tell them, in general, obviously when they have a cough, you want to examine them to make sure you're not missing out on something. You're not missing out on pneumonia, asthma-related wheezing, cough variant asthma, allergies, things like that. After a normal exam, I tell people, if they have a cough related to a virus, it's probably going to be there on and off till March because that's the winter, September to March. And what happens is they have it for three to four weeks. It goes away for a day. They catch something new. They pass it around. So really what we're looking for, what are my red flags other than an abnormal lung exam? So If they've had a cough and then they get a new fever, you have to think about what new thing happened to cause that fever. Could be another virus that they caught. Also could be a secondary infection like bacterial infection, pneumonia, something like that. So fever. Number two, labored breathing. Kids who cough and run around and play, that cough is probably not serious. The kid who's sitting there coughing and doesn't want to play, doesn't want to go to school, sitting there like this, or like huffing and puffing, where you see all their ribs caving in breathing really heavy, that's a concern. Something's going on in the lungs that need to be checked out. In general, those are the two things we're looking for that would make me want to re-examine the child. Other other than that, if they've had a normal exam and they've had cough for two to three weeks, there's really no reason to do usually chest x-rays, blood work, things like that, because it's usually a big nothing. It's usually viral. I know. White lung. It's, uh, it's not a medical term. It's pneumonia. Uh, that pr- in the x-rays you see white spots. Okay, that makes sense. So I've never heard the uh, the term white lung. So when you look at a chest x-ray, normal lungs are filled with air and there's nothing obstructing the airway, so they look basically black. When you have pneumonia, you have areas of white spots. So you can have patchy pneumonia where there's like white dots all around, like clouds. You could have focal pneumonia where it's like a thicker area of white. And so that makes sense. I just hadn't heard that term. I must be. I should have done 12 years of training no, instead of 11. Must have and I must have missed that morning. Fall asleep during that, uh, <laughs> that class. Mm. Are you a doctor that recommends vitamins? Mm-hmm for kids because the kids are taking yeah. vitamins now they're taking like a i think a multivitamin an elder elderberry, elderberry and a vitamin c that's like, yeah is this, i, I, I is honestly this, don't know that it really makes a difference you know until i come out with my own version then no, i'm just kidding <laughs> um there are times where i definitely recommend it so breastfed babies in the first year of life, it's recommended to take vitamin D supplementation and starting at four months, take iron supplementation because breast milk's not a good source of iron. So those are definite times. Um, premature infants in the first year, we usually put them on a multivitamin with iron as well because their iron stores are lower. So we want to raise those. After that, even the most picky eaters in our environment and our where we live, you just don't see, honestly, vitamin deficiency. So is it making a huge difference? I don't know that it is. Um, 
is it going to prevent them from getting sick? No, they're still going to get sick. Um, so I tell people, if the kid doesn't mind taking it and you want to do it, it's absolutely fine. If you don't, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. This woman <laughs> says she has a, like a an elixir. Yeah. And she calls it the flu bomb. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to send it to Patrick. We'll put it up there. Okay. I don't want to get your opinion. The one supplement I do like, I like omega-3 fatty acids like DHA. Um, you've probably seen those fish oils people mm -hmm. have, but kids don't like obviously the taste of fish oil, but they, they make some brands that taste good, like strawberry chews, Nordic naturals makes one, things like that. Um, and omega threes brain development, cognition, visual acuity. There's some good studies on that. So I do like omega threes. If, if you're going to choose one thing, that's probably the one I'd go for. And adults, it's a really good thing too. Because what, what I'm running into and what I think there's a lot of people out there right now talking about. You know, doctors are trained in one specific way. Yeah. They, you know, you go to a surgeon, they're going to tell you sure. you need surgery. They're not going to go tell you you need to go to a massage therapist or a chiropractor or you need to do these exercises. Right. right? They're, they're ready to cut right. your knees open. Um, and this goes kind of along those lines of do you as a doctor trained in what you're trained in. Right believe in some of these um we'll just we'll play it here and, okay. and uh... i'm going to give you the recipe for the flu bomb so the flu bomb can be used for bronchitis it can be used for asthma it can be used for the flu it can be used for pleurisy it can be used for pneumonia it can be used for sinus or a head cold the first ingredient is garlic and the garlic is crushed i'm not putting an amount on there because some people can handle that much garlic some people can only handle half that garlic so it depends what you can handle. The next ingredient is ginger and the ginger is usually, well it can be finely grated and usually the ginger is about a quarter of a teaspoon. The next ingredient is eucalyptus oil. If you don't have eucalyptus oil you can use tea tree oil and it's one drop. Next ingredient is cayenne pepper. Now some people can handle half a teaspoon, some people can handle a quarter of a teaspoon, some people can only handle a little shake. What's your take? So to your point, so I'm Western trained, right? So I know Western medicine. Um, I don't know as much about Eastern medicine, what you would describe as like potions and lotions and things like that. Um, what I've always said is if I'm, if I'm not sure of something, all I care is I want to make sure it's not causing harm. If it's not causing harm, maybe we don't have all the medical studies to prove cause and effect, but if it's not causing harm and it could help, there's no harm in it. My father had uh, cancer. He believes he drank, you know, four cups of green tea a day. He feels that's what cured him more than anything else. I, I don't know if that's true. He's cured. Uh, maybe it helped, maybe it didn't. There's a lot of things we give, you know, colic in babies. You've heard of the word colic. We, you know, babies are fussy in the first couple of weeks to months of life. And we don't know what, exactly what causes it. We don't have an exact remedy, remedy. So we try things like chamomile tea and things with fenugreek and licorice and things like that, which are not proven to be helpful in any way, but can't hurt. So why not try it? So when I look at something like this, I, I think of it under that lens. Nothing, none of those ingredients seem harmful to me. I don't know that it's the perfect cure. I always think if it was, wouldn't everybody be doing it and wouldn't we have already found the cure? Doesn't seem like it could hurt. And if somebody believes it hel it helps them and maybe it does, no harm in doing that. But there are a lot of things. What scares me about a lot of this, I mean, the first thing is when you're asking me questions about medical advice you get from Instagram, immediately my antennas go up because I don't get any medical information from Instagram. You know, I get it from medical journals or if I am looking at YouTube stuff, I know the person who's speaking. So I know the information they're giving is good. But, you know, what, what scares me is there's a lot of people, a lot of specialists out there that find a niche and I wish this wasn't the case. It feels like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a money grab. It's a way to get patients. This is what I do that nobody else does. And they tote these treatments that probably don't do anything, but they can get a good subset of people to believe that they do and they sell them. And 
I don't think that's helpful. There's been there's been a lot of recent uh, articles on. Have you heard of tongue clipping? You know, ten years ago, the number of babies that got their tongues clipped. We're talking about the frenulum. It's that little piece of tissue under the tongue yeah. that can be tight. Ten years ago, it was never done. Uh, if if a baby had it done, it was few and far between. Now it seems like every other baby has it done. So either, you know, Darwin doesn't work that way. Evolutionarily, did all of a sudden all babies in the last decade have tight tongues or does it really need to be t done? And really the indication to have it done is painful breastfeeding because if when you breastfeed, you get the mouth and the tongue under the breast and the nipple and it weans the milk in. If the oh, tongue- Yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a family show. No, this, this is part. <laughs> if the tongue can't extend, then it rubs right on the nipple and that causes chafing and not good extraction of the milk. So it can be painful for the mom and not good extraction of the milk for the baby. So now they're, they're, they're to, clipping for everything. I have to cut you off here. Yeah, sorry. Hey, and I don't even know if you could answer this due to HIPAA laws. Mm -hmm. But have you ever had a baby, right, and yeah. the mother come in, and the mother go, I don't know what's going on, Doc, and take out her breast yes. and show you her nipple and what's going on with the with the. Yeah, Ooh, it's a big part of my job. No, I, I watch I watch and help women breastfeed a lot. I you know, and we actually have a lactation consultant in the office who who meets You're trying to be serious. I know meets, I get this. Yes. I'm just I'm just saying that. You don't think that's part of my job to look at breastfeeding? No, no, I know it's part of your oh, job. Yeah. Yes. But have you have you ever said, listen, let, 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 I'll give you a scenario. Right. Don't come, whip it out here. No. Yeah. Okay. Woman comes in. Yes. Uh -huh. Doc, I don't know what's going on. My, uh -huh. my, my nipples are bleeding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's unbelievable. And then you go, do you go, let me see him? Or not like that. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's some, <laughs> some tact there. <laughs> well, and Dr. Cohen no longer has a medical license. <laughs> well, do you have to say, uh -huh. hey, you know, okay, okay, I need to see the breasts in order so, for me to so diagnose we, what's going we, on. Or do you bring in a woman? How does this yeah. work nowadays? Right. With the male, female, this and that, right. and no, then no, you right, walk, right. she walks out and it's, goes, you it's, have it's, to see my tits. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually much less now because all our patients, we're very fortunate to have a lactation consultant in the office who works with all women on their breastfeeding. So we'll often make an appointment uh, with the lactation consultant, but there are definitely times where I will we'll watch the baby breastfeed so we can look at the latch, we can look at that positioning. Anything problematic on the mother she should see her doctor for but if there's a preventive thing we can do with a, a poor latch then we can help out with that yeah but we don't just say like whip them out let's take a look well, yeah, at no, it. i'm just wondering how that works like that. Like, you know again right. I, I don't know how far humor goes right. in the office <laughs> when you're looking at breasts um listen guys that's our time. I, I, it really that flies it? by here. We got the duck. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, uh, again, um, looking for, we didn't get to them today, but email your questions into us at daddyversusdoctor at gmail.com if you got any questions for the doctor to uh, to answer, and we will get back to you here on Daddy Versus Doctor. Looking forward to your emails and much more fun in 2024. 2024. <laughs>The opinions expressed in this program are not intended as professional medical advice, as a diagnosis, as a treatment protocol, or as a substitute for professional medical advice from your physician. Please consider your own medical history and consult with your own physician for your specific health care and or medical needs and about your concerns for yourself and your family.